Welcome to the first episode of Brent Locked In, a series exploring wonderful and creative personalities made here in Northwest London, in Brent. My name is Maureen Majid. I'm a TV and radio presenter and a podcast creator, born and bred here in Brent, and I can't think of anywhere else better to be right now. In this first episode, we're joined by a poet, an activist, an international model, someone that was dubbed the face of modest fashion. Mari Adrisi, how you doing? I'm good, but it's right. I haven't been called a poet since I was like 15. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but come on, man. It's still there. It's a title that still stands. <laughs> For those who may not have heard of you or what you do, just give us a little intro. Um, okay, so I was the first hijab wearing model in the world. I did a campaign with H&M in 2015. And yeah, the campaign just blew up from there. <laughs> and I just started my career in fashion. But I'm moving into film now. That was what I originally wanted to do, so trying to juggle the two that's so lit man oh, hey yeah. so feature film soon come yeah <laughs> hopefully yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool man so obviously you know the situation we're in right now we're recording this through uh, yeah. on the laptop how are you finding lockdown so far do you know what i don't i think it's actually going quick yeah i'm actually i'm actually getting anxious for when they just say okay everyone ready to go out and be free again i'm be like no i'm not ready <laughs> yes <laughs> It's going to be quite so, crazy, man. I don't know how, like, things are going to be different, like, once this is all over. Yeah, it is, it is, it is a bit mad because um, it just, it, obviously, it happened so suddenly and then it could just end so suddenly as well, even though I, I know they're giving us notice periods and stuff, but mm. you never know. So, lockdown now, you're back in the family home? Yeah, yeah I actually yeah. never moved out way I've Jeez, always, I come thought, on. Oh, I'm not leaving till I get married why am I leaving the house for? <laughs> trust me he wants to pay rent man come on <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but right now obviously we established before we went live that obviously you moved out of Brent area just didn't out down the road in Queensbury but you grew up in Brent right yes so I grew up in Brent I grew up in Wembley to be Jeez, precise come on yeah. <laughs> um what was that like for you growing up there um Wembley's well Brent is the most multicultural borough in in london isn't it so like it's and it's been like that for ages so i've I've not um ever felt any different which is good so it's made life easy being all these layers of mixed and muslim and hijab and you know it's never really been an issue for me which is good so i, I think i've grown up with quite an open mind and we're quite well seasoned people you know <laughs> yeah, <but> figuratively <laughs> and literally <open>. Ralph. <laughs> yeah open to different cultures and stuff so yeah, like I think I think that's really helped. It's, it's given a good grounding for me, especially because I travel a lot. So Sick. yeah, growing Come up on. in Brent has definitely been good. Do you know how your parents actually ended up like residing in Brent? Um. Yes. Well, my my mum's cousin is married to my dad's brother. Okay. So, so my 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 dad's Moroccan, and mm. when when he came to the country. He then suggested to his wife, like, oh, I've got a brother. You've got someone. <laughs> and so that's how they ended up living in the same area. Ah, uh, hey, man. That's cool, man. Keeping family yeah. close, isn't it? That's how it always is, though, isn't it? When you come into a country, you kind of, like, find where your family is and, like, stick to exactly. that area. What are your memories, like, of your area growing up? Oh, I just, I remember, like, on Wembley High Street, like, the McDonald's and after oh. school, <laughs> it's going to be hanging outside McDonald's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fights on the street, oh, you know, yeah, always the times. drama. John, yeah. that's, what, that's what school kids bring with them, isn't it? What were your yeah. favourite things to do? What were, like, favourite places to be? Do you remember, like, during those times, like, growing up in school or high school or primary school or, like, places you like to, your parents like to take you on the weekends, stuff like that? Um, what did I used to do? Like, in Wembley, what well, the park, the park, actually, mm. King, is it King Edward? Ed, King Eddie's, park? King Eddie's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Eddie's yeah, park, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I used to go and play tennis there with my uncle Lit. and my cousins. So we used to, we used to go there. Um, and just, well, to be honest, I never really used to hang out after school just because I lived so close. I went to Copeland, which Oh, is, come on. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so obviously, as you mentioned, your, your father's Moroccan, your mother's Pakistani, yeah. then I'm guessing, yeah. Um, what was it like growing up in a household with like two mixed cultures like that? Um, it's interesting because there's similarities, but then obviously there's there's loads of differences as well. Mm. Uh, but I, I feel like I'm really well balanced. So there's things that I, I think I lean more towards on one side than the other and stuff like that. Um, so again, I think gr- being growing up in Brent, having exposure to so many different cultures and stuff, you just you just felt like everyone's pretty mixed and diverse and whatever there was 
difficulties I'd say in school being mixed because people don't know how to box you so especially my yeah. school was like mostly Jamaicans and then you had a little pocket of the Indian kids and then you mm. had a pocket of just the others <laughs> but then the others were like Eastern Europeans and other races that maybe I didn't really you know could affiliate with too much in terms of like my culture and stuff so it's like you can't put me in the other box but then it's like where okay. where do I belong yeah, yeah trust me man <laughs> you know? what were you like in school <laughs> do you know what I was I was respectful to teachers <laughs> but I did get into a lot of fights Not really mad yeah I got into every year it was like tradition I'm gonna have a fight this year <laughs> like a big fight Not a, <laughs> that is <laughs> Not mad a, like an actual every crowd around you kind of <laughs> that's crazy fight. every single year tradition i don't know i don't know why i think that's the that's the north african fire <laughs> would you say about my mom what were your like favorite subjects at school other than pe or like uh, mma obviously i loved english i did yeah. like english and i liked art i liked yeah. drama um the humanities basically everything except science and maths so yeah <laughs> okay cool cool cool. and what do you do what do you do for like uh gcse's a levels on no do you do a levels did you do that when you went to art college i did so i went to i went to college i did a um okay. national diploma in art and design yeah. and in in for gcse i did what did i take i took art um drama <laughs> What else? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. What what, 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 GCSEs, there's no way you don't choose. You do everything. What am I talking about? No, but GCSEs, no, you, you do pick some stuff. Yeah, what did no, I you pick? Do pick? Oh, my God. I picked. What did I pick? I picked graphics. I picked graphics. I picked music. Oh, I did I, graphics. Yes, I did is graphics. It? Come on. Graphics, music. What else did I do? Graphics, music. This is bad, you know. It's music. Yeah, yeah I, used to, I play saxophone, innit? So I used to do that. Is it? Press the Man cool. of Music Academy. That's how I went every Saturday. Music Academy, yeah, that's where I went. I remember when I first started in like year seven when I was like 11 or 12, I used to like almost cry every Saturday waking up because I didn't want to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then eventually, it's it's yeah, yeah. At the time as well, learning. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, okay, I did it for 10 years. But it's, mad. So you must still remember some yeah. of that, no? I can, I can play acoustic guitar, but Lit. very rubbish. Well, I got my yeah. saxophone upstairs, bro. Once quarantine's over, we'll make a little a little band. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get a vocalist. We do a live. We do a live. Bro, honestly, <laughs> man, we can practice together because I got a yeah. I'm a bit rusty still. Do you know what I'm saying? It's been a while. Yeah, <laughs> that's that jokes. Good. Okay, cool. So <laughs> you mentioned obviously you went from high school to study the art diploma and stuff, but in between, um, we talked about the poetry. I heard that you started going to a youth club and stuff. The poetry. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Um, so I went to, funny enough, in Park Lane, Brent, I, every Sunday, um, I went to an Islamic school there okay. and the, the, one of the teachers called, I don't know if you know Rakeen, do you remember Mecca to Medina? I feel like that rings a bell, but I'm yeah, so they were like in the Sheed group and uncle Rakeen, he was my teacher. And one time in, in class, obviously was studying something to do with religious studies <laughs> And I was writing bars instead. I was writing some <laughs> stupid lyrics. And then he saw me writing and he was like, what are you writing? You're not copying from the board. And I was like, what? Took my paper and just embarrassed me. He's like, reading it. He's like, I want you to perform this in front of the class. I was like, I can't no perform. Way. Like, sticking up people in front of the class, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Things yeah, that I don't yeah, bloody yeah. do. But anyway, so he waited till after the lesson and he said to me, just spit the bars to me. Like, I, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to take the lyrics in. Just, I just want to hear you. Mm. So I started rapping, yeah, some freestyling. And then he was like, you're good. He's like, you've got a good flow. You understand how to like put lyrics into structure, like writing a 16 bar and, you know, putting it into a format. You understand. But why are you writing about nonsense? You know? <laughs> <laughs> why are you writing about gangbanging? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, that's um, jokes. He goes, I, want you to, I want you to go back. Well, when you go home, I want, to write pro I want you to write a poem about the Prophet Muhammad. So I want you to write okay. something about him. Okay. And then you're going to perform it at an event in a couple <sighs> of weeks. So I was like, so then he literally fought like on my first ever performance in front of like 150 people. Wow. And I had to perform this poetry, this spoken word. So before I could, you know, 
make my way into the music scene that I was, I was taken <laughs> into That's the dean scene. <laughs> That's amazing, you know. So he obviously yeah. saw something there and he just threw you straight into the deep end, which is sometimes what you need. You yeah. need to challenge that, kind of, challenge, challenge, channel that kind of like talent or that kind of energy and just put it straight yeah. out there. And I'm guessing you smashed that performance as well. And, and when you did that, it probably clicked in your head like, rah, like, I enjoy this. This is something kind of cool. And then, you know, a whole other yeah. avenue opens up for you, right? Exactly. So I started writing more and performing more and doing that stuff. And that was really good because I think as a teenager, um, it's so important to be able to have something outside of school that keeps you busy as well so that you're not getting into trouble or doing 100, 100. unnecessary stuff. So, yeah. So we spoke briefly about the fact that you went on to study art. Um, obviously, you did a bunch of other stuff before that. What kind of inspired you going down that path? I think when you're a creative and you're young, you're just trying to find you're trying to find what area of the creative arts you suit, what fits for you. So when I was really young, like I loved writing stories and even just copying stories out of books and whatever and drawing the pictures to it. So um, that was, I guess writing was my first outlet, which is why it makes sense I got into, into spoken word because I just enjoyed writing. And then I did art because I really love Disney. As you can see. <laughs> yeah, <on. laughs> come on, Jeannie. I loved Disney and animation and I really wanted to, make films for Disney so drawing and writing again hand in hand kind of thing so I start. I, I loved I loved sketching but I didn't realize how much com everything was becoming computerized and CGI yeah. so it's like oh no I'm not good at the computer stuff I'm not <laughs> going to become an animator now but I realized that after after I already taken up art in college so then when I went to uni I did English and history because I thought let me go back okay. into writing again the writing side rather than so writing played a massive, massive role in what you do. Like that's just that kind of like it was a big yeah. way for you to express yourself, and it all started from that class where you were distracted. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, just like writing stories as a kid to writing lyrics in class. That's mad. The spoken man. word, and then even now, I, I realize a lot of the work I do at this age is spoken. Is, sorry, is public speaking. Yeah, and I think it go. It still goes hand in hand with being able to to articulate yourself, I guess, and write something. So. Which you can do very yeah. well, by the way, man. Even I'm like listening to your story. And I'm like, rah, I'm getting engaged. And I'm forgetting I actually have to kind of like host this thing. I'm just a passenger. No. Right <laughs> <laughs> but as well, um, touching on the whole art uh, college kind of like studying thing, is that when you also decided to start wearing the hijab, if I'm correct? So hijab, again, something on and off, I think inspired by my the school that I went to, the Islamic school I went to. And also the spoken word had a really big oh, wow. influence because I wasn't wearing hijab at, when I was in school at the time properly it was just it was only on Sundays I put it on like yeah, mainstream yeah, 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 like yeah. Nine, Mondays to Friday nine to five Monday to Friday <laughs> school I wasn't so then um I started to feel a bit like a a bit of a hypocrite because it's like I was on stage wearing a hijab when I'd perform mm. poetry but then outside of that I wasn't wearing it and I was conscious oh my god it just occurred to me what if people see me and think what the hell you know uh and then I started to pray five times a day that was probably the key because okay. the more I was around the Muslim community and doing all the spoken word um, and being like a little bit of a figure in that space, it was natural for me to just want to know more about my faith, more about why, why am I doing this? And then, yeah, I realized like it's, it's compulsory for me to pray five times a day. I put on a hijab to pray. So why don't I just keep it on my head all the time? <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And um, at the time, like, did your family and friends have some sort of reaction to that, or were they just very supportive from the beginning? So on my dad's side, no one uh, observes the hijab, and on my mum's side, they don't actually either. <laughs> like maybe some of the older, older generation, but mm. yeah, no one really my age. And my mum started to wear the hijab around the same time I did. Okay. So it was. It wasn't a typical story of I was wearing it because my dad forced me to from a young age <laughs> none of that quite the opposite I had family members actually asking me why am I putting it on yeah so I see yeah, you I mean, had yeah. opposite response okay lit man and you're you're killing now obviously so you put on the you're wearing the hijab you're living your best life um you're in Westfield and you get spotted by a, a talent agent Oh yeah. Um, this is this is that taking it way back. Um were you were you at working at the time in Westfield? Yes, I was managing a children's shop. I was um managing a children's shop and I was still in uni. I was in my last year. No, no, sorry, I just finished uni. I just graduated okay. from uni and stuck in the cheddar. Find, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to look it. for just online looking for jobs yeah, in yeah, film yeah, yeah. and animation and whatever. And then I got scouted by Coralie. 
and she just said oh yeah I'd love to take a picture of you for my books there's <laughs> there's no one that wears a hijab <laughs> I yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah. Posters. <laughs> I was like okay cool and then a few weeks later H&M wanted to uh, use me for the for a campaign so I was like well my first job is with H&M okay not bad not bad at all <laughs> so at the time though when you, the photo was taken and the lady left like did you think anything would come of it or do you just think like it's nah. just one of those things you're just like all right cool safe <laughs> Yeah, I just thought, and the funny thing is, when she said I'm a casting agent, I thought film. I was like, oh, yeah, I did drama. I <laughs> yeah, did yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, cool, yeah, I'll be on your book. Why not? You know, even though the only role was like terrorist wife number two or whatever. For, Boys, for bro, them archetypes, innit, bro? It's so them jarring. Are, yeah. So jarring. Them know. <laughs> we're here to change that, man. Trust me, man. Trust me. Exactly, trust me, trust me. yeah. So obviously the H&M campaign went through. What was it like, like filming that, being in that, being in that kind of like environment, that surrounding... It was, it was obviously different. I mean, I had, I was an extra in adulthood. Oh, <laughs> hopefully, you say hopefully. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm watching that after before Aladdin and I'm going to fast forward slowly and find you. I was you. wearing hijab, so you might not, I don't know if you Oh, so, 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 okay, so, okay. You might not even notice me. But when I was, yeah, I was an extra in that. So I did, I, I had some experience of being on set and, okay. you know, the concept of filming and obviously doing spoken word as well. So it wasn't completely alien to me, mm. but, I had never done a photo shoot before. I'd never modeled before, you know, so that was, that was different, but there was, they were really good with direction and they understood it was like a street casting kind of thing. So, mm. I mean, they had a few, you know, big names in the campaign, but okay. a lot of people were also just, just regular people. Is that advert still available to watch like on YouTube or something? Like, I'm after yeah, yeah, it's still there. The well. campaign's still on, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Lit. Okay. Sick. Well, obviously leading on from that, um, rave reviews you know people uh dubbing you like the face of modest fashion and obviously that's an amazing thing to hear but do you feel like that kind of shut not shoved you but put you into a spotlight and gave you a responsibility that you weren't really actually like expecting to be honest do you know what i'm saying you're like now the face of all hijabis or all like islamic people if that makes sense yeah i wasn't expecting it because i already was aware that online there was you know people with high profiles that were that were promoting modest fashion and doing their thing like all the influencer space so i i didn't yeah i didn't think i'd go i didn't think i'd be noticed <laughs> at all i thought there's so many people in this advert they're not going to notice me but they it was the editorial pictures i think that went viral okay so they'd never seen obviously a woman in a hijab being you know photographed for a mainstream fashion mm. ad so that was what yeah Okay, lit. And now obviously you're an international model. I see you in the Dubai. I see you, I thought, you know, you went to Africa recently as well. Like um, visiting all these amazing places. How does it make you feel about where you grew up? Oh, it, it makes me, again, it makes me grateful because I think bread prepared me for this mm. lifestyle. <laughs> being, again, being surrounded by so many different people mm. of different backgrounds, different religions, different, um, you know, just cultures in general. It, it, it prepared me for, you know, this international work that I'm doing uh, and be, just being a woman of the world, essentially, yeah, lit, you know, nothing, there, there's never really been a culture shock mm. yet. I don't know. <laughs> it's true. It's like wherever we go, like we're very much prepared to expect the unexpected. You know what I'm saying? Like Exactly. Yeah. And literally, I could have a conversation with you. Could be like a Zulu warrior, bro, and I'll have like a, a, a cool, I'll have like a <laughs> you can have, conversation yeah. with you because, like, we see so many different, beautiful, amazing people and cultures within this yeah. like small borough, small borough. And um, yeah, yeah, I think we just grow. We appreciate, you know, everything. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it just and you know, also being, I have to admit, being a Muslim as well as helps because with a lot of the countries I go to, even if we don't speak the same language. Even if we don't look the same, but the fact that we can acknowledge we're we're both Muslim and it's yeah. like you just start off by assalamu alaikum yeah, immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just there's this comfort. Touching on the whole international vibe, you're a person who I've seen on Instagram as well do loads of international accents. <laughs> so I'm not gonna ask you to do any accents, but I just wanted to know like how did you discover you were good at them? I know in your TED talk I watched that the other day that you oh, did, did a, you? a version of your dad, in it, and that was yeah. awesome. That because if I close my eyes, it probably it sounds like a North African man. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. like, how did you know that that was something? Because you're actually pretty good at it. Do you know what I'm saying? And I think I you've done like, think you've done VO dad. work. You've done VO work as well, right? From that. So, how yeah. did that that whole thing like come about? 
so I think that connects back to the film. You see, with me, my 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 the way I look at at life is we should be able to do everything we want to do, but we shouldn't have to compromise our morals or our beliefs because of it. So if there is something that you aspire to do, but you understand that, you know, maybe your religious views will, will restrict you, just find another entry point. So, you know, even like if you want to, if you love football, but you're just not good at it, okay, then get into another field within football. You don't have to be a footballer. There's so many other, you know, things that you can do within that area. So with me and film, I love, I love drama. I love acting. But again, there's not many roles going for women that cover up, yeah, you yeah, know, without yeah. us having to remove our hijab at some point. So yeah. I was like, I, I'm going to try voiceover. <laughs> I yeah. was like, I just, it just occurred to me. I was like, I can be an actress because you still should, you need to have some acting background really and truly, but you don't need to see my face. It doesn't matter if I'm a naked rabbit. Like <laughs> I'm not naked in real life when yeah, I'm filming, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. recording for it. So that that's what it just it just occurred to me like ah oh, that could be a a way of getting in and obviously if we go even further back because I can do different accents you know you can't just you can't just decide yeah, to do, do one accent, accent. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can only do my own accent <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously like if I go back so that's how I got into it so initially yes it was to do with the fact that I just happened to be good at impersonating people <laughs> it was more impersonations and my dad's really good at it as well so I think okay. I've got he's good at doing impersonations I started doing it for, for bands and then I was like oh I'm good at it and I want to get into film so voiceover makes sense okay. kind of fell hand in hand kind of thing during that voiceover during the TED talk you talk about how your dad was saying you know use your platform to promote the family business and stuff like that <laughs> yeah so wait have, have your family got a restaurant I had to hit that my, up. Well, my uncle, yeah. So my 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 cousins and my uncle, like a lot of a lot of my family have. They're in food, the food business, catering. So loads of, loads of restaurants, loads of shisha places. Is that in the yeah. UK, London? Yeah, yeah, in London. Yeah. Oh man, any yeah. in Northwest in Brent? <laughs> there's, do you know? There's so my cousin's got Comtois V and Comtois, not Comtois Living, and not the not the one yeah, that's fake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but um, it's in Kensal Rise. So oh, got mad! Vegan yeah. that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got two there. It's, we got. Do you know Dar Marrakesh? I've heard of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, mad! That's oof, that's a big thing. Yeah, that's lit. Yeah. So obviously, you're exposed to quite a lot of cuisines and stuff. Like, what, where's your favorite place to eat? Like in ends in Brent in in Northwest I mean, in Northwest in Woolston. Do you know what? Spicy basil in Kilburn. Oh Bang. my days, bro! My boys <laughs> always want to go there, bro. Spicy basil, that place is. Do you not know? Have you not been? I've been quite a few times. Yeah, yeah. we okay, used to go so downstairs, the downstairs. The bro, yeah. that place is booming. I've had to wait in queues for like 20, 30 minutes for that place. Yes, man. Now, I, I've basil. never sat inside. It's just you go in there, you you get your food, and you just yeah. leave. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's so um, bad. <laughs> trust me, man. Trust me. Uh, shout out to Lazi's Charcoal Grill as well. They're lit. So we're going to move swiftly on then. I mentioned earlier that we live in like a generation of social media. We're more connected than ever before, which is an amazing thing because it gives you the platform to connect with people like around the world. There can also be some negatives to the whole situation as well. So how have you and how have your family dealt with like your rise on the social media like hemisphere mm. and the platform you've been given? Um, Start off with I you. Think me. So... Yeah. In the beginning, I think I enjoyed using social media more than I do now, if I'm completely honest. Because in the beginning, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't on Instagram like that before the mm. H&M thing happened. So it was just private and it was just, I post whenever I feel like. And then it became a job. Yeah. So that's why I don't enjoy it, I say, as much. I like the whole concept of, of social media. Um, but I just think there is a lot of, I think it just needs to be fine tuned. So I'd love to do some consultancy with Trust someone. Me. Trust <laughs> me. Anyone Instagram watching it. this? Hi, man. Come on. Yeah, because I've got Can ways that I think it could be improved so that, you know, we talk about mental health on a tool that is one of the biggest causes of mental health problems. Wow, so, trust me, man. Trust me. Yeah, so and it's nice. like, I'm not someone that's just like, oh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not into cancel culture and all that. So I'm not, I'm not and I would use that same mentality if I don't like something. I'm not going to say just cancel, you know, the use of this. No, we just need to fine tune it to make it better for everyone. 
100, um, 100, 100. So that's what I think right now with social media, my relationship is, it just needs some improvement. I feel like they sh- in, in order to combat the, all these fake accounts, these troll accounts, when you register, you just got to scan a piece of ID, I think. Like scan okay. a piece of ID, like a passport or a driving license. So that account yeah. is linked to you. So whatever happens through that account, you are responsible for. And that means you can't huh? register more yeah. than one account. Um, you can only have one under your name kind of thing because people probably have 20 accounts and they just troll people and I was going to say do you know what's funny the troll thing never actually was my biggest issue I oh, wasn't yeah. even fucked about that's not my my issue was the pressure to post and create content mad and I and that is my issue like, because I was thinking to myself when you look at life in general you know you set goals you achieve them and if you want to continue you can if you want to stop there you, you, you have that choice you know hmm. so for example, even with filmmaking, if I make a movie and I put it out there, that's it. Mission complete kind of thing, you yeah. know, whereas a social media, no matter how successful you are in real life and online, we don't know how to determine that because you can post, create an amazing piece of content next week and you have to do it again and again yeah. and again for the rest of your life. So long as you are using social media, you never meet a goal. You never feel fulfillment. You mm. constantly have to be part of this to, to maintain it, you know? And I think that's the biggest issue that is unhealthy because there's no cap on followers. There's no cap on this. There's no, there's no ending. <laughs> it that just is... continues. cycle just continues. Yeah. So I think, I think um, that's been my issue because it's like, when do you feel content with awesome. your content? Hey, we should, we should tag that here, man. When do you feel content with your content? <laughs> yeah, because as soon as you, you do one, you've got to do another, you know, mm. and it just never, ever stops. When do you retire? When, you it's can't so retire. true, man. I've never, ever thought of it from that perspective and that angle. Obviously, as someone, you, who like, has to basically put stuff to appease other people or maybe, like, whatever it is, um, you're right, because if you make a movie, you post it out, boom, it's done. Whatever happens afterwards will happen. Yeah, you can reap the rewards. Yeah, afterwards. exactly. But now you could put an amazing piece of content out on Thursday, but on Monday, you got to post something else. Exactly. And that is... And so your mind is in constant like overdrive, trying to think of things. And I always say that content, mm-hmm. my favorite content is ones that seems natural rather than contrived. And it's very difficult mm-hmm. to constantly think of natural content if you're having to post it like every three days, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and sometimes like, and the thing is it's forcing us to abnormally move in double time, you yeah. know? Even now, like I'm sure so many people are feeling pressure at home to create content, but- yeah, yeah like how there's only so much you can do at home without if you're not posting throwbacks you know (laughs) which i had to do love a day blood (laughs) yeah yeah. even the fact that we feel like we have to like it's it's almost as if if you like in normal life again like i said if you're working on a project Mm. and it takes weeks months years to to make you don't need to you're working on that one thing you don't need to post and share your life in between that time if it's not interesting if you're just working on that one thing and then you post it or you share it once you do it but yeah. now we have to constantly be doing things to constantly show it's nuts man you know it is mad it's mad it's un it's unhealthy but i think i, I just think it needs to be there needs to be some fine tuning done improvement you know because it's a great tool it's a great platform to have there's so much good that can come out of it. It's just, I think the scales are. <laughs> I, yeah. So rather than the trolls and maybe the not so nice messages, you feel like the most important thing that may have a negative impact on you is the need to constantly produce things. Yeah. Um, and that just running through your mind. Yeah, I feel like you're right. That It feels a bit like being in a bit of a prison, man, having that. Like, it's that, prison, yeah. Yeah, it feels like literally. Just, that's nuts, yeah. man. Well, you know what, look, man, you just, the main thing is you take care of yourself, isn't it? So, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. That's the main thing. So, uh, yeah. Wow, that went deep. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, trust me, man, trust me. Well, let's, let's move on to something else now. So, um, so what are your plans now? Obviously, COVID has um, thrown everything out the window that we had planned. Yeah. Once things start to get back into shape, have you got any cool projects lined up that you're allowed to speak about? Yeah, so annoyingly, yeah, this year I had about two or three different film screenings of things that I've produced last year that I was supposed to showcase which obviously we can't do the screenings for so that's going to happen next year just projects that I've been working on anyway that I would have been interested in 
putting forward and getting co- getting signed off and produced, which, yeah. you know, it's on hold. But at the same time, do you know what? I'm looking at this optimistically. I think it's also a good time to just prepare all your own personal projects to get ready when we are allowed out and can have our face-to-face meetings and get things signed and, and ready to go. So Hit just the use ground the- running. Yeah. yeah, to work on the stuff that we need to work on. So I'm, that's why I'm quite enjoying a bit of this mm. now. <laughs> no, I agree. Also, it probably like puts less strain on having to produce lots of content, like you said. Like, I think mm. this is a perfect time. Well, for me especially to kind of like just take a back seat because again, mm. we live in we live in a generation and a society where everything is a million miles an hour, and it's yeah. very difficult to snap out of that kind of like trajectory and like actually appreciate like the journey you're going on especially in london like everyone is just doing something mm. it's okay to once in a while do nothing do you know what i'm saying just chill yeah we need to, do you know what's funny it's, it's our ideologies of what success looks like so you know when I'm traveling to places like senegal gambia even just morocco back home mm. when you see how rich people live they do nothing yeah, <laughs> and it's crazy because the western mentality is if you do nothing you're bummy Whereas yeah. back home, it's like, I work hard so I can do nothing and just chill. And even old school Western mentality was like that. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just, our, for some reason, our generation, you've got to look like a donkey to, to almost prove yourself that you're a hustler or you're, you're, you're successful. And it's like, li- literally, that's what it's looked as in other parts of the world. You're a donkey. Like, I don't want to yeah. be, be a donkey all my life, you know? Trust but I think me, it's man. changing our, our views around what success is, you know? Mm. having really amazing things like tours and this and that and you're out here out there that's great but at the same time you're you're still working a lot Mm, and exactly for me i love to work and i will you know as long as i'm alive i'll definitely be working on stuff but at the same time there needs to be balance trust me man i think that if people want to and they feel like it's necessary that they work 20 hours a day then that's good for them isn't it but the, it, it yeah, becomes yeah. it becomes hard for me when you start to push your narrative onto say. other people man like if someone only wants to work eight hours a day and they're doing very well for themselves then let them do that man and even eight hours is a lot you know there oh, are really, lot, people yeah. in the world really successful they work literally in the morning until afternoon and they're done till oh, stop 10 to 2, two. <laughs> yeah literally 10 to 2 quick ting little little stocks then just yeah relax, so it's all about just i think us taking ownership of our own lives and our own minds more importantly to be yeah. able to be be comfortable and you know it's like i always say that like, you can't stunt your rolex to someone who don't want one <laughs> like, you know what i mean if if it's, it's like what are you trying to prove if, if, not, if you don't want that you don't want it I love that. That is, I'm going to flip in, quote that and put that on my uh, flip in. <laughs> I've tweeted like six times. I might just tweet that, bro. That'll be my seventh tweet. Yeah. That's, that's a very good, and it's so true. Like, even when you, when you put it like that in just like bare blunt words, it's like, I'm not interested in that. So no matter how much you pull your sleeve up, I'm not going to like, that's not going to yeah. interest me, bro. The main thing is that like, be comfortable within yourself, man. Don't, don't feel the need to like yeah. go outside of your own comfort zone to try and impress someone that doesn't really care about you. Just be yourself, do what you think is right. <laughs> And things will fall into place, you know what I'm saying? Exactly, yeah. 100. Definitely. That's been an amazing conversation. So Aww. lit. We're going we're gonna to round things off now. So this is something we're going to ask all of our guests. Obviously, we're mm-hmm. in a time of quarantine. People are trying to find things to do. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you what you are currently or what your favourite thing is to read. Um, do you know what? I'm still trying to finish. I started reading this before quarantine, but it's such a yeah. big book. It's called The Laws of Human Nature. Mad. Okay, yes. that looks like a theosaurus, bro. <laughs> <Pretty thing. laughs> but it's so good. Give That's me the lowdown. Give me a quick summary. One of the lessons that I've taken from this book is how to see through people and not see just the surface. So when you do business with someone, don't go to work for them or work with them because, oh, they're super successful, they're super wealthy. They've got all these credentials behind. No, no, no. You have to look at their character. Mm. No matter how sparkly and shiny something looks from the outside, you need to understand how does it work? How does this actually work? Because yeah. you don't want to halfway down the line of working on a project with someone just because they're, they've got a big name or a big yeah. company behind them. They're an absolute twat and you're stuck. Trust you know, because that will, it will ruin. It's better you, you have to look at character. 
you look can at polish, someone's yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the phrase I've heard is that you, you can polish a turd, it's still a turd, bruv. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the thing, so many of us, we end up falling for people because we think on the outside it looks great, mm. but then, and we're just, we're just blinded by it. Again, it goes back to this, like, I think it's not easier, but it's, we have a bit more of an understanding of that concept. Whereas if you're like 14, 15 now, it's all mm. about how you look wearing your Balenciagas, yeah. wearing your Gucci flip-flops, you know, spending four bills on some dead jumper. Like, that's yeah. what it's about. And it's very, and like, that's why when I speak to like young people these days and they have the mentality that we have, I'm just like, rah, you know what, man, I respect you because it's super hard right now yeah. to be thinking because like that. it's so that. easy to be deluded by, by someone comes and present something to you why you should work with them because they've worked with this person that person they've got this much in their bank da, 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 da. And it's like none of that matters if you're an arsehole because yeah. i'm not going to be able to work with you you, <laughs> you know so okay what was the book um, called so again it's called laws, laws of, human, of nature. human nature by robert green lit okay sick yeah. so that's the book now i'm going to ask you about a movie or a tv show that you will like always go back to or you've started watching now you're in quarantine I've been told I'm a bit late, but I'm watching Mandalorian. I've never even heard of that. I'm not going to you. Oh, sick. Ooh. It's a Star Wars kind of spin-off series thing. Um, great. Is really it? good. There's Baby Yoda in it, and I'm just obsessed with him. He's so Is cute. that where those memes come from? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know if there's other Baby Yodas out there. I'm not going to lie. In terms of the Star Wars world, I'm still, I'm still a bit of a, a freshie. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, because all over Instagram or like all over, I see the little baby Yoda memes. Ah, oh, he's so cute. Oh my okay. God, he's so friggin' cute. So yeah, Mandalorian is. I like right. anything that's that's um takes uh, you out of this kind of world. You know, Harry Potter. Yeah, I hear you. you know, that kind of mystical fantasy stuff. All right, and the last one is an app. An app you find that you are checking on every day. Uh, that you kind of rely on. That um has come to you during this time of quarantine. Me, for example, I've downloaded like a running app and I've tracked my oh, running okay. now and stuff like that. So I haven't run like this in a long, long time. Me and my friends have such challenges against ourselves and we have like a little table and we have to kind of register how far we run within mm. a month. So that's something I've kind of like gotten into and I use it quite a lot. So is there something like that that you've been using? For me, probably Instagram. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. I kind of yeah. guessed that to be honest, obviously. Like. Yeah. Sure thing. Well, boom, lit, man. That's been an amazing conversation, Mario, man. I really appreciate you Thank taking the time you. to come and join us on the first Brent Locked In episode. Um, yeah, man, you, the first one. I'm hoping that, you know, this will continue. And starting with you, obviously, such a shining light in the Brent community has been uh, pretty uh, awesome, man. How can people reach you and, like, contact you and stuff? Um, Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's, what's the app? What's the app? <laughs> at Maria, start with a H, the so M A R I A H, Idrissi, I D R I W S I. Hit that up, so people. Like Mariah and Idris. Jeez, <laughs> come on, man. Yeah. Le, le, le. Well, obviously, that's Maria Idrissi. Follow her up. My name is Moeed Majid. You can follow me at Moeed Majid. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. Obviously, London Bar of Culture 2020. Follow them at LBOC 2020 um, to keep updated with everything that's going on London Bar of Culture. This has been Brent Locked In. Join us for the next one. I'm super excited. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thanks.